Film history is a borderless highway of unknowable complexity. Its roads can travel parallel, perpendicular, and sometimes branch off into nothing but dead ends. Few roads are as strange or as disparate as the one marked Japanese cyberpunk. Famed for their aggression and extremity, these movies, not quite horror, not quite sci-fi, and fully distinct from the traditions of both Western cyberpunk and even most of the cyberpunk pioneered in anime and manga, continue to perplex and horrify viewers in rather visionary and abstruse ways. It's a form that probably comes the closest to rendering cinema as an experience of pure visceral assault, communicating idea and feeling through raw image and sound. The films often feel amateurish, haphazard, yet they display an irregular technical mastery that is staggering in its elaborateness. Directors forego logic and story in favor of the overwhelming power of the moment, a surrender to subconscious and sheer primal emotion. The movement was shockingly small and brief, made up of only a passing handful of true entries. It developed obliquely through a few opaque links between odd, unconventional films by unlikely, self-actuated artists. The only purpose behind it seemed a common disdain for the orthodox rules of filmmaking and a shared desire for unfiltered self-expression. Incredibly, it was never planned or premeditated. There was no manifesto to declare it, no guidebook to show anyone how to do it. As the films found their way out, a movement seemed the only way of explaining their existence. In a way, there was no movement, only a very fortunate series of accidents. Burst City is generally agreed to be the official starting point of the genre. It is a wondrous anomaly in Japanese cinema, a testament to the things that can sometimes happen when the right people are in the right place at the right time. The director was Sogo Ishii, a musician slash filmmaker who leapt into making movies as a teenager. Developing a unique style of wild energy and bombastic visuals, Ishii released his first feature at the age of 21, and only two years later, when he put out his second film, the university graduate project Crazy Thunder Road, distributors at Toei, a major studio, took notice and bought the film for theatrical release. This was something previously unheard of in Japanese cinema. In the late 70s and early 80s, the Japanese film industry was in a period of tremendous crisis and transition. Ticket sales were steadily plummeting at the box office. Studios were producing fewer films each year, and most of the big companies were closing down. The studios that managed to stick around were those that lucked upon a convenient survival method. Toho rallied behind Godzilla, Nikatsu turned to softcore porn, and some recruited the help of outsiders. When Crazy Thunder Road turned a profit, Toei concluded that Ishii must be a valuable attraction for the youth market, so they basically handed him 50 million yen, or about $500,000 and told him to make whatever he wanted. Burst City was what resulted. Perfectly channeling the ennui and frenzied rebellion of contemporary Japanese youth coming of age in the hyper-materialistic 80s, Burst City revolves around a semi-futuristic community of punk rockers, bikers, gangs, and drag racers who band together to fight the police and the Yakuza trying to turn their junkyard haven into a property development. The punk movement was just then erupting across Japan, and Ishii, a punk rocker himself, populated the cast with real-life fellow punks, culled from a few of the most popular bands of the era. The plot, by choice, is only a thin pretense for Ishii to document the look, the sound, and the attitude of this angry electric time in Japanese culture. The runtime is padded with several raucous music performances, captured with turbulent, impulsively mobile handheld cameras, an attempt to translate the dizzying rush of live punk music into a new cinematic grammar. 
The cyberpunk influence is more a side effect of that effort. Ishii's film does not share many of the thematic concerns of later cyberpunk movies. Aesthetically, however, it laid the groundwork. In a quote reprinted in a Mark Player essay included with Arrow Video's amazing new Blu-ray release, Ishii explains that his directing style in those days was indifferent to plot or logic. What he wanted to show was the intensity of moments above all. This quote is helpful in deciphering the sometimes cryptic storytelling of Burst City, but it might as well be describing Japanese cyberpunk itself. Ishii's propulsive editing, astonishing kinetic camera style, and grimy handmade art design, prominently repurposing scrap metal and discarded objects, the detritus of post-industrial society, are obviously a touchstone for the genre. That striking art direction is especially noteworthy. Largely the work of Shigeru Izumiya, a prolific folk rock legend who also co-stars as a main character in the film, Izumiya would take his designs a step further four years after the release of Burst City, and in the process, establish every major thematic obsession of the Japanese cyberpunk genre in a film he wrote and directed himself called Death Powder. Produced for the booming video market that was the latest craze in Japan, Death Powder follows two mercenaries who break into an underground facility and discover an android capable of producing a mind-altering powder. When inhaled, this powder causes hallucinations, mutations of the flesh, and potentially frees the minds of its victims from the confines of the body. Even more so than Burst City, Death Powder abandons conventional plotting in favor of abstract imagery and Lynchian soundscape. Izumiya experiments with the layering technology of video to create bizarre visual effects, and his frequent, abrupt shifts in tone somehow contribute to an unsettling atmosphere of enigmatic horror. Interpreting events in this film might be more difficult than even in the later 964 Pinocchio, but as a hallucinatory expression of ideas, Izumiya's choices result in something disturbing and distinctive. Unlike earlier sci-fi films touching on post-human evolution, such as 2001, which viewed the event with wonder and awe, Death Powder saw the process as agonizing and grotesque. Izumiya seems to be saying that whatever waits on the other side of this evolution is fundamentally inhuman, and therefore unknowable. As ordinary humans ourselves, can we view this process with acceptance? or only fear? Does taking the next step in human evolution mean sacrificing our humanity? Could our technology already be actuating the process irreversibly? Cyberpunk does not specialize in answers, only ambiguities. Although Izumiya and Ishii were pioneering something completely new in movies, audiences just weren't ready for it. Death Powder faded into obscurity, and Izumiya doesn't appear to have ever made another film. Burst City was a financial failure, and Ishii mostly left cyberpunk behind, moving into other avenues like concert videos and experimental dramas. In 2000, he released an historical action epic called Gojo, then made a brief return to the aesthetic territory of Burst City, with great, underrated gems like Electric Dragon 80,000 Volts and Dead End Run, before changing his name in 2010 to Gaku Ryu Ishii and evolving his style in other directions. Japanese cyberpunk appeared dead before its time, but appropriately enough, death was not the end. The singular achievements of Ishii and Izumiya would find second life. Fresh ground had opened up for later directors to till and harvest, Death Powder might have been the first real breath of the genre, but Burst City, in its ambition and visibility, would become the beacon, signaling what a young director could achieve when they just went out and did whatever it is they wanted to do. Subsequent filmmakers would follow this philosophy in spirit, if not precisely, in form.
The next filmmaker to take up the mantle was Shinya Tsukamoto. Unlike Ishii and Izumiya, who came to filmmaking through music, Tsukamoto's background was in experimental theater. A precocious child, Tsukamoto spent many of his teenage years making 8mm films with friends and family, but his strict father forced him to find a day job when he reached adulthood. Tsukamoto started working at an advertising company while forming his own theater troupe on the side, which he dubbed Kaiju Theater. Remarkably, Tsukamoto's first serious jabs at professional filmmaking all originated from his theater productions. When he quit advertising to focus on his first feature, Tetsuo the Iron Man, his father basically disowned him, and the following months were a grueling endurance test as Tsukamoto struggled to finish the film almost single-handedly. Working from his admiration for the films of David Cronenberg, in particular Videodrome and The Fly, as well as a childhood fixation on sci-fi and monster movies, Tsukamoto poured out all his frustrations with modern Japan. The central character, known only as the Salaryman, is the conservative Japanese everyman whose dark secrets and forbidden desires take on physical form when his body inexplicably begins to morph into metal. Again, the art lies not in the story, but in the telling. Tsukamoto's film, in true Japanese cyberpunk fashion, is meant to be experienced through sight and sound, not explained through language. Our hero, the salaryman, can no more comprehend his situation than we can. Events connect and flow elliptically like a nightmare, and pent-up feelings of fear and rage burst out in inarticulate chaos. Tsukamoto shows us modern city life through the eyes of a collapsing mind, a world no longer safe, no longer making sense. Tsukamoto wrote, directed, edited, shot, designed, and acted in the film himself. It is a mind-boggling technical achievement. The dizzying camera work and supersonic editing feel somewhat indebted to Sogo Ishii, but Tsukamoto infuses the film entirely with his own sensibility. There are incredible sequences, utilizing a kind of stop-motion technique that allows camera and actors to move at impossible speeds, and scenes of bodily mutation are inventive and graphic. The post-human concerns Tsukamoto voices, implying that his salaryman's deformed cybernetic body may be an accelerated evolutionary process, could owe as much to Izumiya as they do to Cronenberg. They are concerns common to all cyberpunk works, going back to Blade Runner in 1982, arguably reaching as far back in cinematic history as Fritz Long's 1927 masterpiece, Metropolis, a film Izumiya allegedly used as inspiration on death powder. If science fiction is a way of speculating on the future of human society, cyberpunk might be described as a way of speculating on the future of humanity itself. Human beings evolve with civilization. Now that machines and technology have become so prevalent, almost extensions of our collective mind, and as the consequences of that omnipresence become visible, how much might humanity be altering its own evolution? Is the human being of tomorrow organic, robotic, or some incomprehensible hybrid of both? These questions aren't necessarily foreboding of doom, but for the cyberpunk directors, they are a source of deep anxiety. Shozen Fukui wanted to see how far those questions could be pushed cinematically. The third musician filmmaker to find his way to the movement, Fukui had worked on the crew for Tetsuo the Iron Man, and afterwards determined to make a feature himself. Recruiting members of his own band and shooting guerrilla style in the streets of Tokyo, Fukui unleashed 
964 Pinocchio, an experience extreme even by the standards of Japanese cyberpunk. The film opens with a lobotomized sex cyborg being abandoned in the middle of Tokyo. Stumbling mindlessly, he happens upon a mysterious woman whose memory has been wiped. In their short time together, fragments of their identities begin to return, and the unfathomable traumas lurking in their pasts cause a mental break so severe that their minds and bodies begin mutating. There are sequences of such jaw-dropping insanity here that they must be seen to be believed. Fukui's work has been described as resembling the home movies of a psychopath, and that's not far off the mark. Some of his directorial choices do border on lunacy. Fukui favors longer takes compared to his contemporaries in the cyberpunk movement, and urges his actors into performances of such over-the-top intensity, most viewers will probably not be able to handle it. There is likely more shouting and more puking in 964 Pinocchio than has ever been put on screen in a single film ever. Digging a little deeper into Fukui's motivations, his methods make a little more sense. He cites as two of his favorite films Toby Hooper's Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Andrei Zulavsky's Possession, both infamous for their relentless excess. Fukui's intent was obviously not to tell a rational story. As he has explained, the ultimate goal in Pinocchio was to attain a zen-like state of nothingness. By exhausting cast, crew, and audience with a fever pitch of emotion, a non-stop frenzy of visceral bombardment, he hoped to empty their minds of all material concerns, clearing the space for an entrance of transcendent ecstasy. In other words, Fukui was hoping to achieve in reality in the viewer, a version of the amplified mental space previous cyberpunk films portrayed fictionally. As taxing as that experience is, it's also unforgettable, if you can stomach it. 964 Pinocchio may be the most audacious and the most polarizing effort in the whole movement. For other genres, this probably would have announced an arrival. For this one, it was an abrupt collision with the terminal limits. Tetsuo the Iron Man and 964 Pinocchio were underground hits, with Tetsuo even breaking out overseas. But in spite of this, few directors seemed willing to pick up where Tsukamoto and Fukui were leaving off. Japanese cyberpunk demanded total commitment from its practitioners, and as it turned out, not many were capable of meeting those demands. Not even Tsukamoto and Fukui had the stamina to do it more than once. The movies were sort of like punk rock, an explosion of anger and coiled emotion. The purity of that explosion, once it was released, left nowhere to go. The directors could only move on. Tsukamoto parlayed the success of Tetsuo into a distinguished career. Today, he stands as one of the few totally uncompromised and totally independent filmmakers in Japan, his work still fearlessly treading into uncharted terrain. He did film two sequels to Tetsuo, Tetsuo 2 Body Hammer in 1992 and Tetsuo the Bullet Man in 2010, his first film in English. But these sequels are more like reimaginings of the same story in alternate styles. Both are impressive achievements, unfairly maligned, I think, for the nonsensical reason that they aren't exactly like the original. Of course they aren't. They're different. And those differences showcase Tsukamoto's growth as a filmmaker, his development as a person, as age and maturity motivate him to see the world in different ways, and give voice to different concerns. 
Whether we like it or not, life is always moving forward, and art must move with it. Fukui seemed to consciously sense the limitations inherent in a form as extreme as Japanese cyberpunk, saying later that he tried to make his second film, Rubber's Lover, in a way that excluded a cyberpunk element. He shot it in black and white, and adopted a more minimalist approach, one that still strove for a radical level of intensity. Fukui allowed no speaking on set beyond the most basic instructions, and hoped to create a tone unlike any yet achieved in film. It was utterly draining for all involved, and Fukui basically retired following its completion. He now runs a bar in Tokyo, and occasionally releases new short films, none of which have found distribution outside Japan. Rubber's Lover, a rare, difficult-to-see artifact, which I actually haven't managed to view for myself, has attracted a reputation as an exceptionally disturbing film. Some call it cyberpunk, some call it a full-on splatter film, and this is interesting because these two subgenre would become increasingly mixed as time went on. Eventually, Japanese cyberpunk would give way to splatterpunk, a movement of far less thematic depth, but beloved by fans for its imaginative abundance of blood and gore. I do like some of these movies, and a few, like Meatball Machine, contain a similar deranged feeling of invention, comparable to the great cyberpunk works. One movie in particular stands out. Released the same year as Rubber's Lover, Kei Fujiwara's Organ is probably the most neglected entry in the splatterpunk, nay cyberpunk pantheon. Fujiwara was closely tied with Shinya Tsukamoto. She was an original member of the Kaiju Theater, played major roles behind and in front of the camera for Tsukamoto's early work, and was instrumental in the completion of Tetsuo assisting with effects, cinematography, and playing the crucial part of the salaryman's girlfriend. Tetsuo's production difficulties brought an end to their working relationship. Fujiwara next started an experimental theater troupe of her own, and much like Tsukamoto, arranged the script for Organ based off one of their stage pieces. Fujiwara was just about the only woman closely associated with the movement, and she had her own approach to its world. Organ marks a clear and dramatic departure from the established mold. Revolving around a ruthless organ harvesting syndicate, Fujiwara avoids the narrative minimalism of her predecessors by spinning several parallel story threads. In one, we find a disgraced cop determined to track the harvesters down. In another, a second cop is searching for his kidnapped brother, who has become a victim of the gang's twisted medical experiments. And in the third, we find the sadistic brother and sister running the whole operation, both scarred by childhood trauma and determined to survive. Fujiwara's storytelling is less frantic and a little more articulate than Tsukamoto's or Fukui's, she puts more emphasis on character, she conveys more emotional weight, and her plot contains a higher degree of observable cause and effect. This does not, however, make Organ a more accessible film. Much is still left unexplained. Scene arrangement is sometimes jumbled, chronology is not always clear, and Fujiwara's imagery is very explicit at times repulsive, but she seems to have more intent behind it than merely nauseating her audience. Fujiwara explained the ambition of Organ as describing the agony of a wounded soul, portraying people who were decaying inside. Her characters all feel haunted, desperate, guilt-ridden. Their strangely deformed bodies serve as symbols for the psychological rot 
taking hold of them. Fujiwara seems to be contemplating the nature of cruelty, asking where this evil finds its foundation, what consequences result in the committing of unspeakable acts, and what horrible sickness those capable of committing them have to carry around inside. Prior cyberpunk directors bludgeon the audience with their ideas. Fujiwara broods over them. The connection to the cyberpunk tradition is not always conspicuous, but Fujiwara's hallucinatory stream of imagery, her lingering shots of bodily mutations and mutilations, feel at least like an appropriation. One especially unsettling moment has a character suddenly and inexplicably envisioning a woman hatching from a giant chrysalis. This image would be right at home in a movie like Death Powder or 964 Pinocchio. The genre was shifting into a new gear. The splatterpunk films would adopt the basic tools and vocabulary of cyberpunk, but Fujiwara was arguably the last director who used them to voice serious thematic concerns. Fujiwara started filming a sequel to Oregon at some point, but it was never finished. Apparently she wound up incorporating the footage into her 2005 film, Id, an experimental thriller. And after that, she appears to have abandoned film for the theater. She has been reported to still be producing theater pieces near her home in the remote mountain region of Nagano. The funny thing about genre is that it never happens deliberately. Nobody sets out to create a specific blueprint for something original. Originality is created through chance and experimentation, guided by the artist's need to communicate idea and emotion. It's only after the fact that a pattern emerges. Outside splatterpunk, cyberpunk is now an established genre of the mainstream. Following a box office success like The Matrix, most of its days of experimentation are over. This is not to say that once something becomes popular, it loses all vitality. There are still interesting things being done with cyberpunk motifs. The Wachowski sisters often misunderstood Matrix films are a more than worthy addition to the canon. And when you consider the genre's engagement with identity as it relates to the body, the films gain a deeper level of profundity by the fact that they were created by two trans women. But the passing of a movement from the fringes of the avant-garde to the marketing rooms of the industry does signal a kind of end. Aesthetics are engineered into formula Themes pass into shorthand, and meaningful art must begin to compete with commercial product. It's the nature of the industry, imperfect but inevitable. So that makes it essential for us to continue engaging with our art in a serious way. More than autonomy or industry affirmation, art needs a curious and receptive audience in order to thrive. The way we engage with it makes a difference. The brief moment of Japanese cyberpunk's lifespan appears to have passed, but its mad energy and delirious thrills live on. If it inspires something, I hope what it inspires is not the pilfering of its surface extremity and unorthodox technique, but an expansion of possibilities. When we look to this movement, we should be reminded of what can happen when artists dare to throw caution to the wind and create according to their deepest instincts. That doesn't mean it has to take this form, but one form can galvanize another, help lead artists in their own direction, their own search for what they have to say and how they need to say it. You never know what might be out there waiting for discovery until you take a chance and try looking for it. <laughs>